Hi, and welcome back to Heimler's History. In this video, we fit to be talking about the Mongols. Now, thanks to John Green over at Crash Course, everybody loves the Mongols now. But if you would live during their reign and you had resisted them, they would have given you the Black Plague, catapulted your dead, bulbous, oozing body over the defensive walls of their enemies in order to spread the plague to them and eviscerate their entire population. So back then, we wouldn't have bought t-shirts with the Mongols on them. We would have evacuated our bowels at the first sign of their approach. Even so... I admit, the Mongols are pretty awesome. Why does John Green always have to win? <laughs> Doesn't matter, let's get to it. Now over the course of world history, many pastoral peoples took the stage, but by far the most significant of them was the Mongols. The Mongols emerged in the 13th century and within only a few years controlled the largest land-based empire in all of human history. But what's strange is that even though what I just said is 100% true, the Mongol Empire itself left a very small cultural footprint on history. They gave us no new language, no new religion, and no lasting civilization. So let's get into all that they accomplished and how they accomplished it, and in order to do that, we need to start with one individual by the name of Temujin. And that name might not mean anything to you, but you might recognize him by the title he was given later in life, Genghis Khan. So Temujin was born in the 12th century into a network of Mongolian tribes that were fractured and at war with one another. And through a series of unfortunate events, Temujin and his family became social outcasts without much of a way to scratch a living. Even so, Temujin's personality was so magnetic, and he soon forged critical personal alliances among all the Mongolian tribes. Not long after that, he was recognized as a chief among his growing band of followers, and as such, he gained himself a reputation for brutality and ruthlessness with his enemies, and secured a healthy string of military victories. Now, one of the distinctive methods of his conquering is worth noting. In large part, instead of destroying his enemies or making them his slaves, he actually incorporated them into his own tribes. And on the wave of his growing power in 1206, a Mongolian tribal council named him Genghis Khan, the ruler of a a newly unified Mongol nation. And just to be clear, historians of late have changed the spelling of his name to Chinggis Khan, so it's the same guy, just don't get confused. And so now that he was the Chinggis Genghis of all Mongolia and had a powerful army at his beck and call, what would he do? Well, I suppose he could have been satisfied in his accomplishments and sat on the porch of his yurt sipping yak milk for the rest of his life. But that's not what he did. So here's a life lesson for you. When a leader has supreme power and an army at its beck and call bent on destruction, you expand. Gotta have goals. And that's exactly what he did. Now, Genghis Khan's first leg of expansion was into China. In 1209, he perpetrated his first attack against the Chinese, and that set in motion the expansion of the Mongol World Empire. And his attacks were fierce. A recent scholar said it this way. In a flash, the Mongol warriors would defeat every army, capture every fort, and bring down the walls of every city they encountered. Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, and Hindus would soon kneel before the dusty boots of illiterate young Mongols. Mongol horsemen. And my question is, how could the Mongols, with a population of less than a million people, do such a thing? So let's try to answer that question. What tactics gave them the ability to conquer so many other people? Well, the first thing to note is that the Mongol Empire grew without a guiding blueprint. It's not like Chinggis Genghis sat down with a map and drew some lines and said, now that's my empire. No, they just went out and conquered, and the more people they conquered, the more resources they had to keep conquering. And in many cases, the odds were patently not in their favor. For example, when they invaded China, the Chinese population outnumbered the Mongols 100 to 1, and the Chinese possessed far more advanced technology. But in large part, the Mongol success lay in the organization of its army. Genghis Khan organized the entire Mongol society into military units of 10,000 and 1,000 and 100 and 10. And with such organization, he was able to quickly and effectively control and command his troops. And when he conquered a people, they got swept up into that organizational structure as well. Except that he scattered them among different units it so they wouldn't think about rebellion. And in this way, Genghis Khan created a growing army that was fiercely loyal to him. But not necessarily because they loved him, but because they feared him. In fact, his policy was that even if one member of a unit deserted, the whole unit was massacred. And this reputation for brutality actually did a lot of the work for him as it spread to the places where he was headed. His policy to those surrounding nations was as follows. Whoever submits shall be spared, but those who resist, they shall be destroyed with their wives, 
children, and dependents. So obviously he was kind of a moderate. But despite those words, he actually did have a reputation for tolerance. Take religion, for example. Genghis Khan allowed people to keep their religion so long as their devotion to that religion did not become the center of political opposition. So wherever the Mongols encountered Christians or Buddhists or Muslims or Taoists, he largely let them be in terms of their beliefs. Now we've been talking about Mongolian conquest in general, but let's look at how two specific cultures responded to them. China and Persia. The Mongol conquest of China was the most difficult and extended of all, and it lasted 70 years from 1209 to 1279. It began in northern China, and the Mongols' concern was destruction and plunder, but the further into China they moved, their concern changed. As they worked their way into southern China, they were more concerned with accommodating the local population. For example, they allowed landowners to keep their land as long as they pledged loyalty. Now, regardless of the different methods employed, the result of the conquest of China was the unification of China. In fact, some of the more learned Confucians were convinced that the Mongols had been given the mandate of heaven to rule over their people. And while they were in China, the Mongols fit pretty nicely into the Chinese mold by using existing systems of administration and taxation. They even established a new dynasty called the Yuan Dynasty. And under the authority of this dynasty, roads were improved, canals were built, scholars and artists were patronized. So the Mongol leaders very much ruled like beneficent Confucian leaders. Even so, their rule in China was relatively brief. Only about a hundred years. By the mid 14th century, they were forced out by factionalism, numerous peasant rebellions, and the plague. Okay, that was China. Now let's see what happened when the Mongols encountered the Persians. This conquest was far more abrupt than the one in China. In relatively short order, the Muslim Persians fell to Mongol attacks. And to the Persians, this reality was deeply disconcerting. After all, the Mongols were infidels, and how in the world could a band of non believers conquer them so easily? And not only did the Mongols conquer them, they slaughtered the Persians with a ferocity they had never known before. A Persian historian of the time recounted it like this. Every town and every village has been several times subjected to pillage and massacre and has suffered this confusion for years so that even though there be generation and increase until the resurrection, the population will not attain to a tenth part of what it was before. In fact, in 1258, in the sacking of Baghdad, the Mongols put over 200,000 people to death. But what's interesting is that the Mongols were far are more influenced by the Persians than the Persians were by the Mongols. They made use of the Persian administration system and left many Persian rulers in place. Most significant, though, is that the Mongols who conquered Persia became Muslim. And this kind of large-scale conversion didn't happen when they conquered China. And as for the end of Mongol rule in Persia, it was much different than it was when they were driven out from China. In Persia, the Mongols just sort of disappeared gradually. Mainly, they just, over time, sort of assimilated into Persian culture, and eventually they found out that there was no more Mongols left. Okay, that's the Mongols. If you're trembling in your boots, you did it right. If this video was helpful to you, then subscribe and come along because there's a lot more where that came from. If you like the Mongols, hit the like button. If you don't like the Mongols, then hit the dislike button twice. I'm Lur out.